letters spelled L-E-T-T. Privy Council Oath says, a will let anything against the Queen. Uh, the legal term L-E-T-T means condemn, so that the, the Privy Councillors condemn anything against the Queen, which means that if you have a case against the Queen, they have to condemn it. Okay. Welcome to the Andrew Carrington Hitchcock Show on neurofolkradio.com. Today I'm joined by writer and researcher Greg Hallett. How are you today, Greg? Oh, good, thanks. Good, it's good to be here. Um, a first show that I do with a guest, because I always want my guests to return if they wish, I always concentrate on handing the mic over to them, if you like, to give as extensive a bio as you would like to give. And so the idea being is any future shows that we do, I can always say, if you want to know more about Greg, just go to the first show that I did with Greg and listen to the bio and you'll know all about him. So I'll hand over to you, Greg, to give us a story about yourself and about your work. Okay, well, first of all, my website is www.theworldoftruth.net and www.thehiddenkingofengland.com. So what I've done is I've written about 15 books over... First one was published in 2002, so I started researching in 1999. And I quickly, through the contacts I had, I quickly came to realise that everything in the government and everything in the judiciary and everything in the police that they present to do, they actually do the exact opposite. And then I came to realize that the titles that they give themselves, they use those titles to occupy those positions so that no one can do that job, and they do the exact opposite job. For instance, Prime Minister does what every can to destroy the country, and the Justice, the Chief Justice, does whatever they can to ensure that there is no justice and they themselves carry on crimes of murder, uh, fraud, theft, pedophilia, pedophile minding, pedophile enabling. And really it's a, um, a crime creation movement and the judiciary is the mafia. Uh, Andrew, we dropped out before. Are you still there? No, no, I, I'm, I'm listening. No, okay. I, I was just, just going to say, I'm, I do. I agree with those points wholeheartedly, yes. So you can see all the, um, certainly all the governments and the uh, police, etc., never seem to be acting in the interests of the citizens. Yeah, absolutely. They, they actually use codified words with, and misspelt words, or rather words spelt with one letter different, that people go, people miss the spelling mistake. And they read the word according to how they want to read it, but it actually means the exact opposite, like a word that means for all the people with a misspelling. It actually means only for us. And that's part of the um, Lord Mayor of London's uh, oath. Um, so we have these oaths, and we have the Privy Council Oath. And the Privy Council Oath says, we will not let, or we will let anything against the Queen. We will let anything against Her Majesty. And let is spelled L-E-T-T. And let, L-E-T, people think, oh, that's, that's very graceful. You can say anything against the Queen and, you know, speak your point of view. But uh, the legal term L-E-T-T means condemn, so that the, the Privy Councillors condemn anything against the Queen, which means that if you have a case against the Queen, they have to condemn it. Okay. And in all your court cases, it's um, Regina versus you, right? So if you expose something against them, which is they're representing Regina, the Queen, Her Majesty, so-called, uh, they have to condemn it according to their oath. And then if anything is actually said against Her Majesty, they have to report it to Her Majesty as well as condemn it and do it in silence. And they also have to... Um, support and cover up anything against another Privy Councillor. So if one Privy Councillor is exposed for... If one Privy Councillor A gets information on Privy Councillor B being a pedophile, a murderer, a heroin trafficker, or let's say B is a pedophile, C is a heroin trafficker, and D is a murderer, Privy Councillor A has to keep all of those... um, all of the secrets of Privy Councillor B, C, and D, and right. report it to the Queen. 
who then has to cover it up. So the way she covers it up is she gives them, uh, she puts them on the Queen's Honours list and gives them a knighthood and ensures that nothing is revealed until their deaths. And sometimes when it's pressing in the media, like with Lord Jenner, they actually fake his death so that they can get the information out so that he won't be charged. I had a feeling that that was fake, definitely. Um, And then you had all these other situations with people like, um, you know, the guy Ken Ken Lay from Enron, if we jump to America now, I'm not trying to jump across the pond there, but, you know, he conveniently died when the investigation was going on. Uh, You know, that's just not believable. Um, So, yeah, that's very... I mean, that, that sounds very interesting, and it certainly explains the, the Greville Janner situation. I saw a great article where um, the Jews were jumping up and down about, you know, persecution of them, and someone wrote it round and said, well, you've been protecting this guy for years, who was yeah. running, you know, the, I think it, it was B'nai B'rith in Britain, um, and uh, or its equivalent, it was certainly one of those organisations, and it was all known by these people that he was abusing all these children, but they didn't, couldn't care less. Well, the Privy Council oath is really an oath to say that they don't care about any crimes that a Privy Councillor does, and they don't care about anyone who makes a claim against Regina, which is the royal courts or the courts or Her Majesty. Right. So it's a really uncaring organisation. It's really just a, um, a secret club, and you have to be in the back rooms um, having chats and whiskeys to uh, get a decision. And the way the courts are uh, uh, done and the way the laws are written, it's, it's basically like this. You look at it closely, like the civil procedure rules, it's like this. A, we like you. B, we don't like you. If we don't like you, you're not going to win. That's it. Right? They will get you um, doing uh, appeals and appeals to appeal and spending a quarter of a million pounds to get a one-hour case heard over £5,000 if they don't like you. And they don't like you when you've actually ever said anything against the Queen, Regina or the courts. That sounds like what uh, Patrick Cullinane is going through at the moment. Are you familiar with his case? No. No, he's someone that we've had on uh, Eurofolk Radio. He's, um, you know, disputing Talmudic law in England in the form of our courts, etc. And it's a very interesting case that he's taking on the establishment. He's got a lot of support. Uh, I'm going to have him on again soon. Um, I did a show with Paul with um, Patrick. Uh, The two of us interviewed him. So, um, yeah, how about your... uh, your your background with your books and you've got your two websites and what what do you offer there? What sort of books have you written and um, what's available? Uh, in 2000, and the first book I published in 2002 was called Are You My Father, The Family Court and Other Experiments? And it showed that the family court was a social engineering experiment and it was directly down the line of what the Russians and communists wanted in the Cold War and out of the Cold War. And that was socialism for mothers and a police state for fathers. That's exactly what we've got in the family court now. And that's called gender communism, socialism for mothers and a police state for fathers. And when I was in Moscow on the 9th of December 1989, a month after the Berlin Wall came down, I was interviewing the KGB. And they, they called it sex communism, And then they said, we have some of your women training here, end quote, right? So sex communism is is socialism for mothers and a police state for fathers. And what we've got out from that is um, the realisation that the state claims to be the third parent or claims to be the initial parent of a child. And that's partly supported by the all-caps birth certificate scan where the parents register their child in all-caps letter on a birth certificate. And then the government takes that birth certificate to the International Bank of Settlements, cashes it in for a million pounds, gives gives about 50,000 of that million pounds to the family 
and social support and then sends that child to war, kills that child and then cashes in the death certificate or cashes in the birth certificate, terminates it and gets another million quid. Yeah, right. is, is, is that to do with the uh, straw man? That's, well, the straw man, is birth certificate and straw man are completely linked. And David Bowie uh, released the movie or the, the video clip Black Star on the 8th of November. And that was actually completely codified me in my situation. Like if he'd read my latest books, The Hidden King of England, he could not have produced a better video on those books in my position than his video Black Star. And he's got three straw men on three crosses, three crucifixes, right? Okay. So, hey, imagine the crucifix scene where there's three live people on three crosses, you know, Jesus in the middle, that sort of thing. Yeah. He's depicted three live straw men. So people moving around, but they got straw coming out of their bellies. And the central one's wearing a pirate shirt, which is kind of interesting. So um, one of the things that um, I, I found out in writing The Hidden King of England is that the uh, British and European royals all take their um, kudos to be the monarch from Jesus and Mary. Yeah. Yeah. But they tell the masses that Jesus died on the cross. So the question is, where did the child come from? Unless Mary was already pregnant, right? Yeah. But the Catholic Church's best kept secret is that there were two Jesuses, right? Okay. And if you want to harass the church... If you want to harass the Catholic Church, just, you know, ask them about the two Jesuses because it's their best-kept secret. Now, when I exposed that there were two Jesuses, simultaneously there were two popes, right? Right. Because when you come out with the truth, they have to act on it. They have to acknowledge it, yeah? Okay. So Pope Benedict was uh, he resigned, yeah, and then um, Pope Francis came in. But Pope Benedict remained in the Vatican and has a house built from now called Emeritus Pope. So he, the, pope, the previous Pope Benedict lives in the Vatican, yeah? Yeah. Because he was scared for his life outside the Vatican, yeah? Yeah. Now, the new Pope Francis is scared for his life inside the Vatican, so he lives outside the Vatican, right? Okay. So you've now, you've now got two popes, and they did that simultaneously with me saying that there was two Jesuses, right? But, and discovering but, that there were two Jesuses, right? But the two Jesuses, I mean, how do you, because certainly, you know, I believe that, um, you know, that, but there are people out there who say that Jesus is, was God in a flesh body or Yahweh in a flesh body. And there are people that believe that Jesus was the Son of God, but I've never heard of there being two Jesuses. Is the second one a fake Jesus? Or, um, Well, Jesus was the fifth most common name, yeah. And if you look up on the web two Jesuses, this is not where I got it from, but if you look it up, you find that... Um, um, let's see. Who's that educator in Switzerland? I'm just trying to start up a whole set of... So Rudolf Stein, I believe, that there are two Jesuses. Okay. Right? I'm not a Steinerist, but, you know, he, he believed that there were two Jesuses. And the head of the Church of England believed that there were two Jesuses. Right? Okay. And she was the longest standing head of the Church of England. Her name was Queen Victoria. Right. Right, and she spent a million pounds of her day just to check to see if her lineage went back to Jesus. Yeah. Okay. And she found that there were two Jesuses who were third cousins. Yeah. Yeah. And one was actually, I think, the the son of Joseph of Arimathea, and the other one was the was the son of like the Mary Ann lineage. And then Joseph of Arimathea was was hanging out with Jesus' mother. 
So, so basically, I mean... So they hid this information. They hid this information, right? So Queen Victoria go, oh, yeah, I spent a million pounds finding out if I'm descended from Jesus. I am descended from that lineage. And, oh, my God, there's two. So they hid it. And then um, they had to find it again, like, you know, sort of under a cupboard kind of thing. And then um, having the correct providence and then pasted it together so that the origins could be blamed on someone else or some unknown person or was it's done in the Freemason fashion of um, it's true but we don't want to own this personally I'm not to blame I want uh, plausible deniability that's what they did but it's there right so, did you want to say something, Andrew? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, my, my thoughts on it, when you go through the Bible, and um, it says it goes through the lineage of uh, Adam all the way down to, you know, Jesus being, of, uh, I think, in the book of Luke, and he was the son of God. Uh, so if there's a second Jesus, what you're saying is that the name Jesus was a common name such as Paul, Mark, Luke, John, etc., at that time. And so there's been some confusion as to which Jesus was the actual son of God in the Catholic Church and with Queen Victoria. Am I interpreting you right, or do you not believe um, that... I'm trying kind of be softening my statement a bit, but that's okay. It, like, it took me, it took me, when I first got the information right, it took me three months just to get my head around it. Yeah. You know, and then I was, like, I get given these royal marks, and the royal marks are there to show... Uh, certain things, right? And um, at the same time, I was given a royal mark to show that there were two Jesuses, and it was a painting that was done around 1795, and it was John Mark painting Jesus and Mary on a canvas with Jesus and Mary floating in the sky as well in a cosmic egg, right? So that's that's in the books in uh, uh, volume four, I think. Okay. Um, so that was that was kind of interesting. So it is uh, an occult belief, by, and by occult I mean secret, and it is something that's believed in the secret societies. And there's also the belief of the two trinities, the Christian trinity and the Egyptian trinity. Um, and the, the, a lot of Christian writers actually say that everything in Christianity came out of Egypt, right? Yep. So uh, um, Isis, Anubis, and Horus were Mary, uh, the, the father, unnamed father, and uh, Jesus. And Horus and Jesus sound very close together, and they sound like harvest, Horus, Horus harvest. Uh, and you can actually move Horus into Jesus quite easily. But then, then what happens is people go, oh, yeah, that, that scenario happened 12 times through history, like sometimes 300 years apart, sometimes a millennia, or two millennia. But then you've got... Um, the situation where we're in a holographic universe, as above, so below, and that um, sometimes things happen legitimately, which are a repeat of what happened before. Okay. Um, I mean, so what that could be, I mean, you know, I mean, what I've always thought is when the you know, the royal family or these leaders, they go off and you see them going to church and they say they believe in God, you know, Tony Blair, I believe in God and what have you. Well, God is just a title. Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of gods out there and Satan is a god to some people. And I think in that situation that they're saying that. So this second Jesus that they talk about uh, would probably, in, in my estimation, be their attempt to dress up Satan as another Jesus. How does that sound? Uh, no, I think that you know that's actually quite a separate thing. It's when one of the Caesars claimed that he was Jesus and Lucifer, and that was in about AD fifty. Yeah, no, that that's a different scenario. But like, if you look at the um, the, the the quite well documented um, situations of Jesus, you've got Jesus studying in the mystery schools in Egypt. You've got Jesus in Galilee. You've got Jesus in Goa in India. You've got Jesus retiring in Tibet, India, Tibet, that border. Um, you've got Jesus in the Algarve. You've got Jesus in 
England in Regney, which is Kent, which is Kingdom Come, uh, and in London, and you've got Jesus in Scotland as a, um, a military leader, and you've got Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea in South Wales. So where is all this information from? Because, I mean, this isn't in, in the Bible, for example. Um, no, it's, it's in a lot of quite well-documented books. And, and what happens, like, you know how they say Jesus was a carpenter? Yeah. He was more um, an architect priest, right, who built out of stone, and he left his foundation in the foundations. Right, right? okay. So um, um, I went, uh, I spent a couple of years finding Jesus' graves, right? Because these were marks of kingship, yeah? Yep. So that if I find Jesus' graves and prove it, then there should be some reaction within, say, the Catholic Church and the British monarchy and the European monarchy, right? To sort of endorse or... To to silently say, yeah, you got it right. Here's the mark that is absolutely undeniable, which most people will miss, right? Okay. But they can't, they can't let you win the case legally because all of the judges have sworn the Privy Council oath as well as all the members of Parliament, which means they have to let anything against the Queen. They have to condemn anything against the Queen, right? Right. But the Queen herself can fund objects out in the realms of the world and reality that everyone focuses on that absolutely validates everything that I've said, right? And three of those things are um, the laws of succession, uh, the abdication of King Juan Carlos of Spain, David Bowie's Black Star movie, and the Paris attacks on uh, 11, 13, 15 which were actually a gullibility shock test when no one died. Yeah, I thought they were, a, a, or they call them a false flag. Event. Yeah, it's a false flag, but actually if you look up the um, uh, silent wars, silent weapons, or weapons of the silent wars. Yeah, that was in the, I first read that in the William Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse book, bit yeah, silent it, weapons for quiet wars. Yeah, silent weapons for quiet wars. Um, what they actually do, they, they base society on an electronic formula like current equals voltage over amps, that sort of thing. But they've actually got a fault in their formula, which I picked up when I kind of investigated that in about 2009. I wrote about 30 pages on it. Um, so, um, uh, so um, what they've done is they've acknowledged that I've got some stuff right. right? Now, I, I don't expect people to get the two Jesus thing straight away. And I, I, I actually expect that most people won't accept it. But it is um, a best-kept secret in the, um, in, the, in the Catholic Church. And um, it is known in the occult circles and the secret circles, and it is codified in royal marks. And Queen Victoria, the head of the Anglican Church for 63 years, did actually discover that there were two Jesuses. And um, Queen Elizabeth I was also into the two Jesus thing, and she spent a lot of time raiding around the areas where the second Jesus was. And um, a lot of that led... And then the Catholic Church also raided the areas where the second Jesus was. And so everything was... You know, what was a temple covered in gold mosaic, gold and glass mosaic, um, was actually ended up having no mosaics and the roof missing and three-quarters of the walls crumbling. Okay, I think that the. I mean, so, so what, what I did when I when I discovered the second Jesus, I went and recorded the Easter Friday celebration, and then I published the book, and then I went back to the Easter Friday celebration in 2015, and they changed the ceremony to obfuscate the very obvious bits of the ceremony that confirmed the second Jesus. 
Oh, okay. I think that uh, a lot of our listeners, because uh, we're, we're an identity kind of based group and we have different people on with different ideas, certainly on my show. But I mean, my firm belief is that uh, Jesus was the son of God um, and some people believe that Jesus was God in a flesh body. So this second Jesus, I really wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't have any belief that he was anything related to God. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I'm quite confused about the situation. I would say that it was surely some sort of imposter that they're talking about. Um, but how- uh, Yeah, well, the evidence is that they were very close and they worked together and that the... Um, the Marys, which was also a priestcraft, you know, the female priestcraft, the Marys worked together with both Jesuses. Um, so, you know, I don't think that the Jesus would want to deny the other Jesus because they were, they were very close. And, and I, it actually developed around the um, English-French channel. But, so you're, you're on this show, your belief is Jesus died on the cross, caput, son of God, spirit of man, all that sort of stuff. And that's well, it. Uh, no, essentially, what we 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 believe that um, the white race and the Israelites of the Bible. Um, yeah, I think I think that that's true. Mixed with the the Hebrews, which a lot of them descended to um, the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal, and Spain. Yeah, well, even I mean, another host on the network, um, Pastor Dan Johns, he put something out about uh, Hibernia in um, you know, Ireland, Scotland area. And there was there's actually a Scottish football team called Hibernian. And yeah, well, Hiberia was Ireland, and Iberia was Portugal, Scot- uh, Spain. Yeah. And so Iberia and Hiberia were so related in their belief systems, which is kind of interesting because the second Jesus lived in Iberia. Yeah, at the same time. And he used to um, run initiations. That was kind of how he made his living. And he had um, he had a property with a spring on it, so the water used to flow down. He he was a vintner, he grew grapes, so he, he literally turned water into wine by having a, a spring and a and a vineyard. That was part of the code for where he lived. And the other thing is that his physical address, his geograph- geographical ad- geographical address, was was Christ. If you read it in the old one form of Aramaic. Okay. How about the... Actually, the Shin Christ, which means the secret Christ, was his geographical address. You see, there are no um, sort of post office addresses with numbers and, and stuff, right? So you had like a geographical address. You get into that geography and then you have your names and numbers. Uh, but then, then you'd have, you know, the local knowledge that would, would get, the, get the information to you. But a lot of the, um, um, what, what the second Jesus did, Jesus the Elgar, he used to run initiations for the Roman Caesars in exchange for taking one of his sons as their own. That's how Jesus' sons became Roman Caesars, or grandsons. Okay. Uh, as I say, I mean, I dispute this. I mean, my, my, my position certainly is that, uh, you know, Jesus was the son of God. There was one of them. And if there's this other one, running around it's not something i'm familiar with because i go go off the uh you know the the, the bible and i've looked KJV, at the, kjv line well it, not just kjv i've looked at lots of different bibles you know i've got rotherham's and farrah fenton and yeah. young smith and goodspeed etc so i've looked yeah. at different things but i think um it's interesting information what you say but i mean my belief would be unchanged that uh i would think that these other things that are coming out are maybe trying to uh direct people in a different direction, certainly. Um, there may have been other people, there's even people today that have a Christian named Jesus. Uh, this name is quite popular amongst, you, you know, a lot of South Americans and they get given the name Jesus this or whatever you see that in Mexico a lot. But um, essentially, um, as I say, the information certainly interesting, but I would say that there was only one true Jesus. Uh, and I do believe that that was Jesus who died on the cross and uh, as written in in the the scriptures and whichever version you look at that story is you know pretty much unchanged you know you've got different words in different translations etc but that certain element seems to it run completely unchanged what's your thoughts on that 
Um, who wrote the Bible? Well, I mean, it was um, different writers for the different books in the Old and New Testaments. Yeah, it was kind of written from about AD 120 to 240, uh, roughly. It wasn't written con contemporaneously. So it wasn't written by the apostles. So you had people writing under the apostles' names. Well, I know that the Old Testament, that uh, there's uh, original manuscripts that exist for the New Testament, but the Old Testament was handed down by oral tradition, is claims that are out there as well. And yeah. then things like the Dead Sea Scrolls pop up uh, and, and different things such as that. Yeah, Dead Sea Scrolls seem to focus on um, the bits of the Bible that were removed from the Bible. Um, There's certainly a lot of that. I mean, I, I don't dispute that. I mean, even in my book, I did a book called In the Name of Yahweh, and it's mentioned there's certain books that are mentioned in the Bible, and it says the book, one of them is the book of the law, and I'd have to look up to see the other ones. And it's sort of mentioned in the Bible, but then you can't seem to find those books anywhere. And so I've no doubt that the Catholic Church has, you know, removed certain books that they don't want you to see and I mean even if you look at the Apocrypha that used to be standard part of the King James and by removing that they've literally removed the the bridge between the Old and New Testaments essentially and they've removed a lot of information that's very useful to Israelite background especially if you look at the book of Second Esdras but I know that some people listening who uh don't share the belief I do or, or do not believe in God or do not believe in Christ or what have you. Uh, but my position would still be that I do honestly believe that there is a God out there. I believe that he's the father of the Israelite race and uh, the blessings were handed down to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I believe that the Jews are imposters. They claim to be Israelites and they're not. And I believe that they're the seed of Satan from Genesis 3.15 in the Bible. And I believe that the white race today, the reason that we're being attacked so much and through immigration into our lands, all this corruption that you talked about in our, in our own governments and in royal families in the white nations that still have royal families, you always see the Jews involved in that corruption. And it's this non-stop attack, at whether it's sending us off to war against each other, England against Germany, and then America comes in and you get all these white people dying all over the place and suddenly the solution is to bring in lots of immigrants from other nations and once the immigrants are over oh, they're, don't worry they're doing jobs that you don't want to do and then they'll turn around and the next thing they're ramping up the miscegenation amongst the race so it's the war I, kills off right. white I, agree, I agree with all that that's, that's all that's all I do uh, an Ashkenazi Jew and an Ashkenazis um, are from Jazakistan Jazakistan yeah. Near the Caspian Sea, uh, well, actually, all of the Caspian Sea, um, and then they <clears throat> migrated and got into banking. Yeah, I'm trying to say that less because the the echo was going on there for so long. Um, yeah, you're clear yeah, now. So the, the the British royal family and the European royal fam families all claim they're descended from Jesus and Mary. So you know, explain yeah. that. Um, if Jesus died on the cross, explain that. But you've uh, got some interesting information, I think, about... Um, wasn't uh, Queen Victoria impregnated by Rothschild? Yeah, well, what happened was um, um, the British royal family were uh, basically bankrupt. And um, <clears throat> uh, the Duke of Kent, Stratham, um, had to borrow money off the German Rothschilds to fund his marriage to Princess Victoire Louise, uh, German. So um, the, the uh, German Rothschild said, yeah, sure, we'll fund the wedding as long as uh, we get the breeding rights. So the breeding rights um, was done in a, in a uh, Merovingian bestia Neptune procreation tradition, otherwise known as a menage a trois, and the, uh, the male... Male partners were uh, um, Nathan Rothschild, the English banker, and his youngest brother, the uh, French banker, um, Jacob Mader Rothschild. And Jacob Mader Rothschild seemed to hold 
and they produced um, Princess Victoria, who became Queen Victoria. So <clears throat> she found out about this with uh, the Duke of Wellington's help by about the age of 10. And then she had a cousin who was blind in one eye called um, um, Prince George of Cumberland. They were the same age, born three days apart. So she got pregnant to him, and then they married. Um, and because George, of, Prince George of Cumberland was um, second in line to the throne and Victoria was illegitimate, uh, he was actually first in line to the throne. And because Victoria had bore a child in 1834 to the second in line to the throne, who was actually the first in line to the throne, she was then, therefore the legitimate queen. And so she was Queen of England and also called herself Queen of Hanover and Queen of Gotha. Okay. And then the, the, the first one's son was called Prince Marcos Manuel. He was born in Carlisle Castle um, in the very north of England. And in the Egyptian uh, pharaohic tradition, rain means rain. And as long as it rains, water from the sky, the pharaoh rains. R E I G N. I understand, yep. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's all about harvest in those warmer countries. And if it doesn't rain, then the pharaoh's killed, basically, and removed, and you get a new pharaoh. Didn't happen too often, though, but. Um, so, in order to confirm that Prince Marcos Manuel was the king of England, um, was, was the son of the first and second in line to the throne and was made the King of England in 1869 on St. Bruno's Day. Bruno was the founder of the original British peoples, 6th of October. So in order to confirm that Prince Marcos Manuel was made King John II of England on St. Bruno's Day, 1869, until he was killed on the 1st of April, 1910, that had massive rain over Carlisle. Carlisle's been flooded three times. Yeah? Okay. Yep. And, and rain means rain. So R-A-I-N that comes from the sky means that there was a rain born in Carlisle. R-E-I-G-N. Yeah? So are you saying that that was somehow drummed up by a It's codified, it's codified right? They have to acknowledge the story because it's true but they don't want to do it through the courts or the media because they all swear the Privy Council oath. Yeah? Yeah. So what I'm telling you by flooding Carlisle three times this year is that there was a king who was of the Star family, who was king of England uh, from 1869 to 1910. And um, as soon as... Uh, Prince Marcos Manuel was made King John II of England by Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria relegated herself to Victoria Regina, Empress of India. Yeah? Yeah. And then built a porch in front of Rosalind Chapel in 1869 to 71 to show that the Sinclairs were porch monkeys. Okay. And that they weren't the Star family, that they weren't the Sangreal family, they weren't the the prime bloodline, but that Prince Marcos Manuel was because his father, Blind Prince George of Cumberland, who became King George V of Hanover, his mother, the Duchess of Cumberland, Queen Consort of Hanover, was a Mecklenburg Strelitz. And the Mecklenburg Strelitz had the strongest bloodline to the Jesus and Mary lineage, which is called the Star Family. Right. Okay. Yep. So Jesus, Son of God, comes from the stars, Star Family. Yeah. So in the broader, they're called, also called the Deuce Family, D-E-U-S, um, which means the main family, and the, the cousins of that family are called the Despocigny. Right. And the Despicini papers are um, probably the most secret papers in the world, and they record the actual history of Jesus and Mary and their lineage and what the Darnham achieved, and also predictions. And um, 
Uh, there's only four people in the world allowed to see it, and it's protected by an elite army. And occasionally a pope is allowed to write four lines at the end of his life. On this document? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's sort of the level that we get the information from, you know. I mean, how about if we take it forward? So if we go forward from Queen Victoria now to the current Queen. Okay, so you... what, what I have from, there's, there's, between Queen Victoria and the current royals born, there's about 30 illegitimacies. Yeah. <laughs> Three zero, right? And there's only two, there's only two who aren't illegitimate. <laughs> right. Well, certainly looking at the, I mean, I, I saw that story about, um, you know, I'll, I'll take you, I, I want you to take us back to bridging the gap between Victoria and Queen Elizabeth, but just this information that, um, you know, James Goldsmith is the actual, was the actual father of uh, Princess Diana. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah well, is I, that I, correct? I, yeah, well, I've just produced um, produced a chart on it. It took us about five months, right? So we've got um, about um, 85 names on it. Um, well, you talk us through we've got, we've got about probably 90. We've got 90 people on it, right? And so we show the true rule line. And basically, Queen Victoria was, was illegitimate, but she married the second in line to the throne, Blind Prince George of Cumberland, who became King George V of Hanover. And Queen Victoria actually retained the crown of Hanover for 29, almost 30 years. Right, she wouldn't give it back because she was the Queen of Hanover. So then that goes to Prince Marcos Manuel, who was called the prize. He was King of England from 1869 to 1910. Now, Queen Victoria then married um, Albert of Saxony. He was promoted as, as Prince Albert of um, Sachsen, Coburg and Gotha, but he was actually illegitimate and he was known and was Prince Albert of Saxony. Of Saxony means illegitimate. Okay. And he was an absolute pauper, and he wore a Prince Albert, which was um, uh, basically his his uh, his penis was tied with a chain. It's a male chastity belt, so he couldn't have coitus, so he couldn't conceive any children. And Lionel Nathan Rothschild conceived all of the nine official children with Queen Victoria. That was the British banker. Yeah. Right? And... and uh, Prince Albert used to give Queen Victoria Baron Dango to relax her body. So um, the first child, Vicky, became um, Empress Vicky of, of Germany. And the second child was um, became King Edward the Seventh, and he actually murdered, uh, committed regicide and murdered Prince Marquis Manuel, King John II, in 1910. And then himself died um, five weeks later. Okay. Right. Um, well, it looks like King, the fake King Edward the Seventh from 1901 to 1910. He was known to be phrenologically insane. He was he was actually a complete nutter. He would just um, all he'd do was um, hunting. This is his own biographer saying this: hunting, um, rooting, and feasting. That was all he did, and he was um, as round as he was tall. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's about That's two not how they different. portray uh, Henry VIII as quite round as, was he, as he was tall, certainly in the, in the yeah. pictures yeah. that you see, the paintings. Um, and then uh, the, the second-born son, Alfred, Duke of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, he had uh, a son, um, the hereditary prince of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, who realised that the entire British royal family was fake. Um, and on Queen Victoria's... Uh, Jubilee in 1897, he held a pistol, loaded pistol to Queen Victoria's head as he was dancing with her, his King George III's pistol. And he said, tell them who Bertie Prince of Wales' father is. And then he was, uh, his death was faked. And he, he had seven different causes of death. This is Prince Effie. And he ended up living in Romania with his sister, who was the Queen of Romania. And then he followed his his daughter, who married the king of Yugoslavia. Um, in Romania, he was, um, he changed his name to William Branner, 
Brown is short for Born Royal and Now Alone. And then when he went to Yugoslavia in 1922, he, uh, uh, he was made a prince, Prince Karadjordjevic, and given the surname Battenberg Tudor Karadjordjevic, which was uh, shortened to Kadic. Then he married Princess Helena, who's Yugoslavian, escaped out of Russia. She was married to one of the Russians who was reportedly killed, one of the Romanovs. And then they lived in Cap Ferrat. And then Prince Afi released the story to his neighbour, Somerset Maugham, who's the British author spy. And then Somerset Maugham swore secrecy that he wouldn't write the story, but he got John O'Hara in America to write the story. Um, so the character they use in the story is Julian English, which is the jewel of the English, who married Caroline English, which is carry on the line of the English. Okay. Right, so the jewel of the English became the jeweled skull in David Bowie's Black Star video. Right, I understand. Yeah, you see a lot of this, uh, you know, in, in this media, you see all these sort of, you know, occult references. They're always trying to get things out that if you turn on your news, you just get lies, but then they start telling you things in music videos or feature films. You always find symbolism in there. Oh, absolutely. Like, they use films, to, like military films, they use those to show you what they've got, and they use sci-fi movies to show you the, the, the technology that they've got, right? Yeah. So, for instance, the movie Avatar was saying that the British Navy, the people called the Navi, or Navy, the, 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 the American Navy has body jumping technology. Because yeah. the whole movie Avatar, Avatar was about body jumping. Yeah? yeah? And if you hold the thought of body jumping and you watch movies, you'll see that there the, are uh, a surprising number of movies about body jumping. And the, the first of the sci-fi movies that came out, you know, when they were really bad, and that was showing, that was showing we want this technology. You know, Star Trek was about we want this technology. Yeah. But now the Star Trek today is we have this technology, you know, because the, first of all they had to excite the imaginations of the people and the scientists, etc. you know to get the technology so the right people to come forward. So now they've got body jumping um, technology and they're telling you that through the Avatar movie. Anyway, so what, what Prince Afi, Prince Afi, who was the hereditary prince of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, he escaped, he had his death faked in seven different ways and he ended up in the south of France in uh, saint jean cap -Ferret. And then his grandson delivered us their copy of the Almanac de Gotham, French version, 1912. And in that, on pages 98 and 99, they had written their surname, Kara Djordjevic, and their new name, Kadic, the short name, Kadic, in pencil. Right? And then told us all the stories. So, so it took me seven years to write up the story about how the hereditary prince of the Duke of saxe coburg and Gotha, which is the second or third crown of the United Kingdom, had escaped. And through that, I was able to name who the true uh, Duke of saxe coburg and Gotha was, which is my co-author. And um, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and then um, Duke Ernst II of saxe coburg and Gotha, who died around 1893, the German one, he gave us his sword to show that we were the true Dukes of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha, German and British. Oh, that's interesting. How about the um, the story about, because obviously now this we're talk, going back to talking about the fake royal line, but the fake royal line, let's talk about the current Queen, Queen Elizabeth. We've got about yeah. eight minutes okay, left. Okay, well, so I just, uh, we've got about how long? Eight minutes? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, so so King Edward VII was illegitimate to... Um, with Lionel Nathan Rothschild and Queen Victoria. And then his illegitimate son was Winston Churchill with Jenny Jerome. Right. And yeah. then Winston Churchill um, uh, provided the sperm 
for um, artificial insemination uh, baby, not in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination, it's been used for centuries, um, uh, sperm with Elizabeth Bell's lion. But Elizabeth Bell's lion uh, was engaged to Edward the Seventh, Edward the Eighth, who said he was going to abdicate. So instead, she became engaged to George the Sixth. But um, George the Sixth was not need. Had a terrible stutter. He had an IQ one point above retarded, and he's a chain smoker alcoholic. So Elizabeth Bell's lion switched herself with her maid, who had been with her since I was seven years old. And Elizabeth Bell's lion's maid married King George VI. And even then, the maid didn't want to sleep with George VI because not me, alcoholic, chain smoker, retarded. So um, Winston Churchill, oh, they did actually have an artificial insemination child and it, it was born epileptic and was left to die in the hospital gurney in 1924. So then Winston Churchill was brought in to provide the sperm with Elizabeth Bell's lion's maid and that produced um, Queen Elizabeth II and Princess Margaret. Right. And just winding back. No, they're Churchill. legitimate. Queen Elizabeth yeah. II, illegitimate. And then um, Lord Louis Mountbatten found out about this because he lived in, the, um, in Broadlands where there was a painting done by Queen Victoria's governess of the children, which codified that Bertie Prince of Wales, King Edward VII, was illegitimate, and that Marcus Manuel was the true king. So Lord Louis Mountbatten got his nephew, Prince Philip, who's a complete, utter, total pauper. He had two suits and 20 quid in his pocket. And they rolled up to Buckingham Palace and said to George VI and his wife, Elizabeth Bell's Lyons, maid, and said, you guys are illegitimate. We know this from three generations back, and we know that this is Elizabeth Bell's Lyons' maid. And we know that you, George VI, did not sire Queen Liz, uh, Princess Elizabeth. So my pauper, Prince Philip, is going to marry Princess Elizabeth. And we will keep quiet about you, George VI, and Elizabeth Bell's line being fake. And George V being illegitimate and Edward VII being illegitimate. And <clears throat> George VI and his wife, Elizabeth Bell's line's maid, said, well... <clears throat> we like living in this nice palace, so okay. Okay, that's interesting. How about... Um, cause... And then one other thing, one other thing, and, and, and Lord Louis Mountbatten also said, and um, I shall have your firstborn as a sex slave. Right. Right, so Prince Charles was a sex slave. He was born a sex slave. And Prince Charles had an extremely close relationship with Lord Louis Mountbatten, and there's this photos where... Um, four-year-old Prince Charles is sitting on Lord Lou Mountbatten's lap with about nine of the other family around, just sitting on armchairs. And um, Prince Charles has his hand on Lord Lou Mountbatten's upper thigh and Lord Lou Mountbatten has his big erection. And everyone's just sitting around. Unbelievable. How about, because um, cause you went... Um because I have it down that uh, Jenny Jerome, definitely she she was um, Jewish, but it was um, Randolph Churchill. So you're saying that basically it was Lionel Rothschild and Jenny Jerome that produced Winston Churchill. So Winston uh, yeah, Churchill. It was Bernie Prince of Wales who became King Edward VII. He had an affair with Jenny Jerome, got her pregnant, and then um, as soon as they found that out, Jenny Jerome, uh, or King Edward VII, Bertie Prince of Wales, who became King Edward VII, he got his mate, Randolph Churchill, who was a high-ranking Freemason, to marry Jenny Jerome. And then Winston Churchill was apparently born a month premature, but he wasn't. Right? And for such a, uh, um, a wealthy family as Jenny Jerome, who's the daughter of a newspaper magnate in America, and Randolph Churchill, their marriage was a hushed, rushed and hushed affair whereas it should have been extravagant. Yeah. Right? And then Randolph Churchill was basically, he had syphilis, and he was uh, sent to South Africa to walk around, get lost and die. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, so then... Jenny uh, was already yeah. pregnant by Lionel Rothschild, that's what I'm trying to... Or, or... No, 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 no. Sorry, I'm no. getting confused. Not Lionel Rothschild, 
Bertie Prince of Wales, King Edward the Seventh, got Jenny Jerome pregnant, and that produced Winston Churchill. Right. Okay. Final Nathan Rothschild was the grandfather. He was the father of King Edward the Seventh. Right now, I've got you. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I was, I was a generation now. Post of this true royal family selling it for twelve quid. He's like uh, poster size. Well, I mean, the thing is, it still shows that obviously that shows that uh, Churchill is a Rothschild because he was the grand. Uh, Churchill's, yeah, Churchill's a Rothschild. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now, if we we've only got a couple of minutes left, have we got any time to go into? We can do this on a subsequent show, but have we got any time to just quickly talk around the, you know, um, with Prince Philip, Queen Elizabeth, all those children? Are they all? Yeah. Well, let's look know? at that. Let's look at that. Okay. So Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip have Prince Charles and Princess Anne, and then Prince Philip shoots off and has affairs and children with other people. Queen Elizabeth has a relationship with Lord Porchester and produces Prince Andrew. Queen Elizabeth has a relationship with Lord Plunkett and produces Prince Edward. So Edward. Prince Andrew and Edward are both illegitimate. Now, when he, uh, Camilla Parker Bowles and Prince Charles were dating when they were teenagers, and on Camilla Parker Bowles' 18th birthday, uh, Prince Charles sired a child with Camilla, and that child was born Simon Charles Day, and he grew up in Gosport, and then he went to Australia and became a telecommunications engineer, married, divorced, and married again, a woman called Alviana Durante, who's um, very black. She's half Aborigine, half Papua New Guinea, which is called a Tory Strait Islander. And they had six half-caste children, and five of them survived. So Queen Elizabeth has five black grandchildren. That's great, very interesting. Uh, five black great grandchildren. Yeah. Um, so Diana was the, the daughter of Sir Jimmy Goldsmith, who's um, who were neighbours with the Rothschilds. She had an affair with James Hewitt and produced Prince Harry. Prince Harry's bisexual. Okay. Yeah. And then she had an affair with King Juan Carlos of Spain and produced Prince William. All right. Prince yeah. William had no intention to get married, but I delivered a letter to 10 Downing Street claiming the throne. That went to the Queen. The Queen said, oh, that's real. So she then instructed Prince William to select his girlfriends who would get married. married and uh, their children are not theirs. George and Charlotte are not their children. That's very interesting. Well, we can continue this on another show, but thank you very much for joining me today, Greg. It was fascinating information that you presented. And um, we'll talk again soon. Uh, Thank you for joining me, and thank you, the listeners, for listening. And see you soon. Julian English, which is the jewel of the English, who married Caroline English, which is carry on the line of the English. Right, so the jewel of the English became the jeweled skull in David Bowie's Black Star video.